The property that adjoins, co-adjoints, preserve limits, co-limits is useful in daily mathematical life. We state the proposition. Let FG be in a joint situation. Then 1, for a diagram D in A, if L, P, I is the limit of D, then G, L, G, P, I is the limit of G, D. And 2, for a diagram D in B, if S, I, K is the co-limit of D, then F, S, I, F, K is the co-limit of F, D. To prove 1, let B, Q, I be a cone on G, D. Then F, B, Epsilon, D, I, F, Q, I is a cone on D, since for an I morphism D, the diagram below commutes since the right-hand square is a naturality square for epsilon and the left triangle commutes because B, Q, I is a cone on G, D and a functor preserves cones. So by the universal mapping property of L, there exists a unique factorization H such that epsilon D, I, F, Q, I is equal to P, I, H. Now consider the following diagram. The right-hand square commutes because it is the image of the square above under the functor G which preserves commuting diagrams. The left square commutes by naturality of eta. Therefore, g p i g h eta b is equal to g epsilon d i eta g d q i for each i. But by the triangle identity, g epsilon d i eta g d i is equal to the identity on g d i. So this becomes just q i. And this holds for each i. Therefore, g h eta b is a factorization of the cone on b through the cone on g l. We have left to prove uniqueness to show that it is the limit. Since FG is in a joint situation, there exists this isomorphism of Hom sense. So if K is another factorization, it gets mapped to epsilon L FK by the definition of the isomorphism. For each I, postcomposing by the projection PI gives us PI epsilon L FK. But by naturality of epsilon, we have PI epsilon L is equal to epsilon d i f g p i. And so we have this equal to epsilon d, epsilon d i f g p i f k. Since f preserves composition, this is equal to epsilon d i f on g p k. But g p k is equal to q i since k is a factorization of the cone above. So we have this is equal to epsilon d i f q i. But by the construction of h above, we see this is nothing but p i h. This holds for each i, so by the universal mapping property of L, h must be equal to epsilon L f k. But then we can apply the inverse of the isomorphism, which by definition will take h to g h a to b. But since applying the inverse should have gotten us back to k, we must have g h a to b is equal to k. Therefore, g h a to b is the unique factorization, and therefore g preserves limits which completes the proof for part one. Part two is just the dual argument. You may pause the video to verify details if you're having trouble.